Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Speed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I'm your host. Delighted to be here with you this hour as another episode of the Ask Noah show kicks off. This is an exciting episode because it is one of my favorite episodes to do, and that is a special edition episode. Now, why do I like doing special edition episodes, and why should you continue to listen to the rest of the show? Let me tell you. I think there's something to be said about doing something later at night after I've gotten off work, I've had a chance to kind of wind down and relax a little bit and just come into the studio and have fun. Now, we have a new system that is tracking listeners at AskNoahShow.com. Now, when I say tracking listeners, I don't mean we're stealing your data or anything like that. I just mean that it identifies the country from which you're listening to. So, hello to Mexico. Hello to the United States. Hello to Germany. Um, hello to the Ukraine. Hello to Japan. Uh, it's cool to see a bunch of people tuning into AskNoahShow.com from all over the world. So it gives me a chance to test out new technology, things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to use. But the other thing I like about it is it lets me experiment a little bit with the format. And so I can try being a little more relaxed and and not as driving and energetic and and all of those sorts of things. And then, of course, if it goes over well, if you like it, then let us know. Go over to AskNoahShow.com, click on the contact form, and let us know. Hey, I really like these special edition episodes. Keep doing them. And... um, Obviously, listen to them live if you can, because that will show up in our system, and then we know it's worth doing. Or download the episode afterwards at podcast.asknoahshow.com. You'll find all of the the articles and references mentioned during the episode. Of course, as always, phone lines are open. 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 855-450-6624, as well as we have our email up and running live at asknoahshow.com. Headline. Linus is back. This comes to us from ZDNet.com. Linus Torvalds is back in charge of Linux. At Open Source Summit Europe in Scotland, Linus Torvalds is meeting with Linux's top 40 or so developers at the Maintainers Summit. This is his first step back in Linux since taking... His first step back in taking over Linux's reins. In Linux 4.19 announcement, Greg KH, Linux's temporary leader and maintainer of the stable branch, wrote, Linus, I'm handing the kernel tree back to you. You can have the joy with dealing with the merge window. Now, I have to eat a little bit of crow, and I'm not, I'm not unwilling to do that. I am not unwilling to sit in front of this microphone and tell you when I'm wrong. And I was wrong this time. Because I predicted there was a fair to highly likelihood that Linus Torvalds was not going to come back. Now, I said that because I believed the things that they were asking Linus to do, which was to change the very nature of his character, the very nature of the way he interacts with other people. I think or I, I thought at the time that that was a far stretch. And I thought that after some reflection, after some time away from the public eye, Linus would himself realize and admit that he probably can't change his character. Leave it to me to underestimate the great Linus Torvalds because he is rising to the occasion. Now, I'd be interested in chatting with him. I'd be interested to ask him, are you doing this just with tooling? Are you, are you doing what you said you were going to do and just essentially created an email filter that removes file language from from the email before it goes out because Linux needs a visionary. Linux needs a leader. And as much as I'm not a fan of Apple and as much as I am not a fan of Microsoft, Apple would not be where it is today if it weren't for the efforts of Steve Jobs. And Microsoft would not be the mess that it is today without the leadership of Bill, Bill Gates. Leaders matter. And having somebody that 
is at the forefront, at the helm of the Linux kernel, and at the same time, is somebody who values Linux on the desktop, is valuable to us, the Linux desktop users. Here is my question to you, the listener. Do you actually believe that this has changed Linus's behavior? Do you believe that he as a person has grown? Do you believe that his character has changed and, and now he's a, he's a different person and he's found a, a newfound respect for humanity? Or do you think that to a certain level, this is a system by which a publication comes to you and says, we are going to run this very negative piece about you. And you realize that your life's work and the organization that you represent is about to get drugged through the mud because of some bad things you said in an email. And so you look up and you say, okay, self, what can I do about this? Well, the only thing to do is to face the public scrutiny head on, which is what he did. And you give in essentially to the demands of these people. You say, okay, well, I'm going to change. I'm going to be, I'm going to rise to be a better person. And now you have everybody, you give on one side, you give people the gratification of saying, see, we were right. He admitted he was wrong. And on the other hand, what, what does he really lose? I'm not sure if I have an answer to that second question, other than maybe the ability to command the Linux kernel and command some of the people around it. Because I think that public chastising was a tool in which by to eliminate bad code. People who could not code well, people that did not have valuable contributions, I think were very self-conscious about contributing to the Linux kernel, mainly because they knew that they would get publicly ridiculed. So have we actually changed anything? Again, open phone lines this hour, 1-855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. We also have our community mumble room open. You can join the mumble room by going to mumble.jupiterbroadcasting.org and joining the Ask Noah Show channel. We'll take your questions, comments there. Theverge.com headline, Google mandates two years of security updates for popular phones in new Android contract. Every month, a security team at Google releases a new set of patches for Android. And every month, carriers and manufacturers struggle to get them installed on actual phones. It's a complex, long-standing problem, but confidential contracts obtained by The Verge show that many manufacturers now have explicit obligations about keeping their phones up to date written into their contract with Google. This is massive, massive, massive news coming out of the mobile sphere. One of the largest criticisms of Android, particularly as it relates to Apple's iOS, is that iOS, you're going to get your updates. And with Android, you're left with this. It's been referred to by, uh, you know, as a vulnerability in your pocket. Now, I have long since questioned the validity of those kinds of of those kinds of claims because the reality is i just most attackers go for low hanging fruit and i just question how many people are interested in getting into noah j chalaya's cell phone in his pocket through some sort of exploit it's not like i install a bunch of apps it's not like i'm connected to a bunch of random networks i mean at the end of the day they're going to have to come at me bro over the internet so I question how big of a deal it really is. That and the other thing is the market to a certain degree takes care of this, does it not? If millions of people were rocking around with exploitable devices in their pockets and millions of people were getting exploited, then millions of people would quickly learn the consequences of walking around with uh, you know, vulner you know, vulnerabilities in their pockets and millions of people would change. I feel like to a certain degree the, the market would take care of this. But that has remained, fair or unfair, one of the largest criticisms of the Android platform. Now, I have to be honest with you. I don't particularly like either platform. I'm not a big iOS guy, and I'm not a big Android guy. I think both platforms leave a lot to be desired. But of the two operating systems, there are a couple of things that have always elevated Android above iOS for me. The first thing is that I can obtain administrative access over an Android device, and it is very difficult, if not impossible, to do that on an iOS device. Now, when the, your best chance to do that is when the newest iOS device first comes out. They have a bunch of jailbreaking procedures um, that work, and then 
in my limited experience, and granted I've not owned a lot of iPhones, but in my limited experience, those the ways that they go about to jailbreak these phones gradually diminish. And uh, I can honestly say I don't know many iPhone users that actually jailbreak their phones, whereas almost every Android user I know has rooted their Android phone. I like to have administrative access control over my devices, and it boggles my mind that we would buy a device from a subscription service, no less, and not demand that we have administrative access over that device. We would never accept that from a laptop. If you went to a, into a store and you went to buy a la- and you went to buy a computer and it said, "Well, you can only use the Windows limited account." The administrative account, uh, you, you can't log into that. you got to get Microsoft's permission. You have to call them. And if you want to install a program, Microsoft would have to approve it. We would never, ever, ever tolerate that. But for some reason, the most prolific computers of our generation, the computers that are with us all the time, those computers, for some reason, we tolerate that ridiculous limitation. And the only answer ever given to us by those that are proponents of these kinds of controls is, well you know what, it's better for you because you're safer that way. And so everybody has flocked over to, or not everybody, a lot of people have flocked over to iOS. And their answer has been, well, hardware is terrible on the Android side. It's hard to get a good phone. And it's a varied experience because depending on if you get a Samsung or a Nexus or a Pixel or a cheap LG or whatever, then you're going to have, the experience is varied. And then the third thing is, always seems to come up is, well, the updates. If you're on Android, you're not going to get updates. You're going to have a walking vulnerability in your pocket. Well, now Google is addressing that problem head on, and they are writing that into their agreements with these hardware contracts. And so no matter what you ma- no matter what phone you make, a budget phone or a Pixel, you have to provide updates to your users for two years. That does two very important things for me. The first thing is, it lets me know that Google is moving in the right direction and when their resources, time, and the market allow, they are pushing forward. The second thing it does for me, well, let me back up more on that first thing. The other thing is iOS beat them to the punch when they came out with the mobile operating system. Now, I would argue that Palm OS beat iOS to the punch when it came to mobile units altogether. But of the two, iOS or Android, the two largest mobile platforms today, iOS was the first one. So Google had a little bit of catch up to do from the beginning. So if it takes them a little bit longer to catch up and surpass in in whatever ways that we have lagged behind iOS in terms of providing updates to all users all across the board, I think we've been ahead of the game when it comes to app selection and flexibility and customizability of the phone itself. By the way, there is no iPhone that you can buy for $39 or $59. There are Android phones that you can buy for $59. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be a fantastic experience, but I am telling you that Google is going to mandate two years of security practices or two years of security patches if you buy any of these phones. Chat room points out in the uh, in the chat room says, I'm, I'm SIM swapping my UbiPorts Nexus 5 for a Mint SIM. I have a Nexus 5S, so UbiPorts will... Ubi ports won't work. I still question if there's room in the mobile sphere for a third mobile operating system, but I think we are getting closer. This changes the mobile landscape, though, significantly, because I think that one of iOS's biggest competitive advantages over Google just got thrown out the window. Furthermore, in mobile news, Apple and Samsung have both been fined for intentionally slowing down phones. An investigation launched in January by the nation's competition authority found that certain smartphone software updates had a negative effect on performance of the devices. Believed to be the first ruling of its kind, smartphone rather manufacturers, the investigation followed accusations that operating system updates for older phones slowed them down, thereby encouraging the purchase of newer phones. In a statement, the antitrust watchdog said Apple and and Samsung implemented dishonest commercial practices and that the operating system updates caused serious malfunctions and significantly reduced performance, thus accelerating phone substitution. In other words, 
Samsung and Apple intentionally tried to screw up your mobile experience so that you would spend more money with Samsung and Apple. Now, there's a couple different ways to look at this because I think when you actually dig into the technology, what you find is there is a, it's a, it's a multi-tiered approach. And I tried to dig into this case a little bit so that I could, I could bring you a little bit more perfectly executed technical analysis. It seems to be a culmination of factors. So the first factor, the obvious one, is obviously we iterate and we program and we design around newer hardware. So for example, when the newest generation of the Samsung Galaxy comes out, when the Samsung Galaxy 10 comes out, for example, Samsung, for obvious reasons, is going to write their operating system, target their software, and base their user experience around taking advantage of and optimizing the hardware that is in the uh, Samsung uh, you know, S10 or whatever. Conversely, if you have a Samsung S9 or an S8 or an S7 or an S6, those phones are likely going to be impacted by the newer software updates simply because it's trying to leverage newer hardware that doesn't exist in those, on those older platforms. The second thing is app manufacturers seem to be doing the exact same thing. And these were the two arguments that I originally saw and that I keep stumbling across when, I, when I'm searching for information about this that were presented from Apple. They say, yes, the older phones slow down, but it's not, because, uh, it's not only because we are trying to intentionally slow them down. The other part of that is we just create newer software, we create newer operating systems, and thus your phone tends to be just a little bit on the slower side. The second thing that Apple came out and said is that they did it as a power saving feature. They're concerned about your battery life. They're worried about your experience and they're thinking that your phone may die faster because of all the new performance requirements given by the newer operating system update and the newer, the newer app updates. So this is, a, this is, a, it's, we are at an interesting point in the in the mobile architecture world because i think that there's a lot of people that are going to look very negatively on apple and samsung i really do believe that's going to happen and i think you're going to start to see smaller manufacturers and i think you're going to start to see niche manufacturers pop up and become more prominent look at what happened with the one plus one what iteration are they on now and when they started they called it a top tier phone but i played with the one plus one it was no Samsung S6 or whatever the comparable version was at the time, right? But they sold like hotcakes. Why? Because people in that mobile sphere, particularly geeks, wanted a specific feature set out of a phone and wanted that feature set at a specific price. And Samsung was unable to deliver on that. Apple is unable to deliver on that. And so what you find is you find these smaller companies that pop up and they say, okay, well, we're going to we're going to compete in that space and we're going to provide you a better product at a lower cost. And so when stories like this come out, it really kind of throws a wrench into the argument of, well, I'm going to stick with the known good quantity, right? Because that's what you hear from a lot of people. You have people that have the top end smartphones and uh, you know, to a certain degree, myself is included in this because I have a pixel. I probably will upgrade to the pixel three. You hear a lot of people saying, well, I have that because I don't want to compromise on my mobile device. I want the best mobile device money can buy. And some people think that's Samsung and some people think that's iPhone. And now you have obviously other tiers that have popped up around the OnePlus category and of course around the Pixel category. I think this starts to diminish that reputation that if you spend eight, nine, you know, a thousand dollars on a smartphone, because that's what some people are spending nowadays on these stupid things, you're not I mean, you're going to get updates for two years, so I guess we got that going for us. But your phone is going to be intentionally slowed down by the manufacturer, and there's nothing really that you can do about it except for buy a new smartphone. And I'm not sure, I'm not exactly sure where we go with this. QZ.com headline, this year's Nobel Prize in economics was awarded to a Python convert. Economics involves a lot of math and statistics. The most commonly used tools to crunch numbers are the spreadsheet software, Microsoft Excel, and programming languages, SATA and Mathematica. These are the tools that tend to be taught in economic classrooms across the world. All three, all of, all three of them are proprietary and privately owned. And my article jumped up on me. 
Romer believes that in making research transparent, he argues for openness and clarity about methodology. And he says that's important for scientific research to gain trust. As Romer explained back in April in a 2018 blog post, in an effort to make his own work transparent, he tried to use Mathematica to share one of his studies in a way that everybody could explore every detail of his data and methods. It didn't work. He says that Mathematica's owner, Wolfram Research, made it too difficult to share his work in a way that didn't require other people to also use the same proprietary software. Readers could not see all of the data or all of the code that he used for his equations. Instead of using Mathematica, Romer discovered that he could use Jupyter Notebook for sharing his research. Jupyter Notebooks are web applications that allow programmers and researchers to share documents that include codes, charts, equations, and other data. Jupyter Notebook allowed the code written in dozens of programming languages, and for his research, Romer used Python, the most popular language for data and science statistics. Importantly, unlike notebooks made from Mathematica, Jupyter Notebooks are open source, which means that anybody can look at all of the code that is created in them. This allows for a truly transparent research. In a compelling story for The Atlantic, James Summers argued that Jupyter Notebooks may replace a traditional research paper shared as a PDF. The more I learn about proprietary software, the more I worry that objective truth might perish from the earth. A lot of things hit home with me on this story um, when this broken came out. And one of the reasons that I felt this is a perfect example of what these special editions do for you, the listener, because this is the kind of story that it's not really something we can spend a lot of time talking about on our, you know, if I only have one night a week, this is a story that probably wouldn't make the catch. And if we had a lot of callers that were calling in, this is probably not the story they want to talk about. But it is important to shed a light on people that are doing cool things, specifically when those things are not purely motivated by open source and Linux. No, what do you mean by it's not purely motivated by open source and Linux? Well, there are some of us, like myself, who will do something purely because we want to see it done with Linux or with open source. And we're willing to take a certain amount of performance uh, compromise or performance hit. We're, we're, we're willing to work around a certain amount of obstacles to make that happen. This guy just wants to get the work done. He just cares about the goal. He doesn't care about the technology to achieve the goal. This guy just wanted to publish his research and just wanted to put the information out there so that he could help other people. And what he found, and he found it out the hard way, is that companies who manufacture software are often more interested in earning a dollar than doing what's right and helping out fellow humanity. And so what they do is they say, sure, you're welcome to share your software, we, or your, your, uh, your research. We would love you to do that. Share it in our proprietary format. We'll sell copies to all of your friends at, you know, whatever, 1500 bucks a piece, and we'll make it with a little USB key that you have to stick in and has to sit there in the computer. And if you ever lose that little authentication key, we're going to charge you another $1,500. I've worked with companies like that. They're trash. They don't care about getting the data out. They care about making a dollar. I'm all for charging money when you do a good job. I'm all for charging for a service when you provide results to the, you know, to your customer. But in this particular case, the point of this kind of research, the point of this kind of data is to get the data out there. Because if there's anything we know from open source, it's when we work together in a collaborative fashion, when we're able to put things up on GitHub and use the collective brain trust of the internet, we're able to accomplish much greater things. You are seeing this pop up in places we don't expect it. Again, this is from people that didn't give a rip about Linux, that didn't give a rip about open source, and they did it anyway because what they learned is that they're not able to accomplish their their goal using proprietary software. And I have said this about colleges and high schools and even in the workplace today. Why is it that we constantly push for Microsoft Office or even Google Docs when we have a perfectly capable office suite that it could be free to all students, that all of the fonts could be free to all students, all of the formatting and templates and all of that could be free to all students, and they can continue to use it even after they've departed the school. Why do we jettison that idea in favor of proprietary software? When I was in college, 
that's what, what that's what we were expected to do. We were expected to go to the college bookstore and fork over the quote unquote discounted price of Microsoft Office Student and Home Edition for $189 or whatever it was. And that was a huge discount from the $399 that Microsoft wanted to charge. And Google is slightly better from the standpoint that they don't want to charge you a ton of money. The problem that I have and that many people have with Google is they get their money through advertising and through pri privacy violations. The very thought of my son learning all of the G Suite things that he does in school, but having the public education system track him from literally the day that he entered kindergarten all the way up till the day that he graduates high school, and then to believe that Google is going to just sit on that data and not go to various accounting companies and hospitals and, and, and law offices and say, oh, you're a medical firm and you're looking for people that have a high aptitude in math. Let me tell you about so-and-so who we've been following since day one of kindergarten and has a very high aptitude of math. Oh, you're looking to hire somebody with good language skills. Let me tell you, you know, and they can sell this data and it's, it's going to be worth hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars by the time these kids get all the way through. And it's being done effectively without consent. I have had no say in my child's interaction with these technology platforms. And there is very rarely a discussion about using open standards. Oftentimes, those people are laughed at. Why are you suggesting that? Why are you suggesting that LibreOffice thing? Why are you su suggesting that Microsoft Office knockoff? We're not. We're trying to, we're, we are trying to focus and show you tools that will accomplish the same goal for less money and with greater access to students to arm them with better tools so that when they depart the school and they're no longer eligible for those great discount programs, they still have tools to, to fall back on. My friend, uh, my friend, friend of the show and, and personal friend, Chris DeLuca was here a couple of weeks ago. And him and I were having a very similar conversation about this because his school, uh, he's a system administrator for a school in West Virginia, and his school is an all Microsoft shop. And they're unabashedly, unashamedly uh, promote Microsoft to all of their students. And nobody seems to have an answer of what these students are supposed to do when they graduate and decide they want to start their own small business and now all of a sudden their home and student version of Microsoft Office won't let them, you know, cover up, you know, write a cover letter or a resume or whatever because that's considered business use. Then they have to go and use Google Docs or LibreOffice or something like that. So I submit again, why don't we just do that from the beginning? I am so thankful to see that this is becoming the standard in the scientific world. And it is becoming the standard in the scientific world. We work with the University of North Dakota. I've I've done some um, contract IT administration with their chemistry department, all, all all sorts of different places. And what we have found is that they are very receptive to cost effective tools that will accomplish the same thing. And I have not dealt with this specific situation, but I have had conversations with people in the administration that have said, "Listen, we have to be able to share data." And data has to be interchangeable, you know, in, in various different formats and into various different software. And we have solved that a couple of different ways because the industry that we were working in didn't have open source available tools. But I'm happy to see that that's a shift. Greg in the Ask Noah chat room says, schools hate Linux because you're a hacker if you use Linux. And there's a lot of truth to that. There was a lot of truth to that when I was in high school. When you set up a machine and you're using Linux and somebody comes over and sees a desktop environment that they're not familiar with, when they see a terminal that's open, when they see text flying across the screen and they don't understand what that is, it makes school administrators nervous because they know that they're coming to the party late and they know they're coming with a half deck. They know that the students that are there already know more about the technology than the teachers do. And so it creates a fundamental problem to administrate the school to begin with. Another guy in the chat room says, my daughter's school uses LibreOffice, but that's because that's because they set it up on all the computers. I'm going to assume that message says that he set it up on all of the computers. And that's, that's great. That's fantastic. I hope we see more of that. The good news for us is as Google with their massive resources continues to push into education and they're doing it rather successfully. My son's school, all G suite, they got G suite everywhere. 
And while I have my cons- my own concerns about the privacy implications of G Suite, what I do have to give Google is one, it's an easy platform to use because if you literally, if you have Chrome, you're able to access their software, which means it is friendly to us as Linux advocates because Chrome and Linux runs just as well on Chrome on a Chromebook as it does in Chrome and Windows as it does in Chrome and Mac OS. The second thing is, at the moment, they don't have an outright cost associated with it. So privacy concerns aside, at least you have the ability to continue to use that software after you've moved on past the education system. And thirdly, and arguably most importantly, the default document format that Google is actually based on or actually uses is ODT. So you can download a document, you can download a presentation, you can download a spreadsheet off of G Suite, and you can open that natively, I might add, with LibreOffice or OpenOffice. And I think that's moving definitely in the right direction. And I've already had some of those conversations, not with the school, but with the business. They were on G Suite, and they we had a discussion with them. They said, hey, you know what? We are interested in... We've been using G Suite. It's working very well for us. We're very happy. Is there any native app for G Suite? And I said, well, there's no native app put out by Google, but there is a native app put out by LibreOffice. And I've said this on the air before, Google kind of allows us to reset the expectations, reset the conversation, reset the dynamics. Everything starts as a web app. And when we move into local apps, it's kind of like a step up, but we can do that into Linux because they have become accustomed to these open standards. And once you get on an open standard, you're not soon to jettison it because it ultimately means less money spent, easier to train, and easier interoperability. You're not locked into G Suite. You're not locked into LibreOffice. The two are essentially interchangeable. And that same cannot be said about any other product, really, and Microsoft Office. They, uh, they, a, a company called Anchor, most of you are probably familiar with this company. I have a number of accessories from them that uh, they're essentially a company that makes power accessories. They have released the latest and greatest new USB-C charger. Now, this is a 27-watt charger, and uh, they say that it is, a, is one of the most reliable, inexpensive USB-C cables and power bricks that has been released. Um, the company may have just changed the game with their newly announced PowerPoint Atom PD-1 power brick. It's a 27-watt USB-C power delivery, so PD, charger that's the size of a junkie 5-watt plug that comes with your Apple crap. Anchor says that the difference will be with the Atom series of charger will use the gallium nitrate components over silicon which the company says adds for increased efficiency and dramatically smaller size. The company also says that the Atom PD-1 will be the first in the line of Atom chargers with a 60-watt, two-USB port, power port Atom PD-2 charger and a 100-watt, a 100 watt rather, four-port USB-C and two USB Type-A ports. The Anchor power port Atom PD-1 is expected to be available at the end of November for $29.99. I, USB-C has, I mean, it is not an over-exaggeration to say that USB-C has changed my life. I was the guy that when I traveled, I travel with a work phone, a personal phone, a tablet, a laptop, and, uh, and well, and a hotspot and a couple other electronics. And so I, Anchor, actually provided one of those um, eight-port USB-A charger things. You have one AC cord and then it gives you like eight USB Type-A ports. And that was useful to me because I could charge all of my devices and only had to pack one charger. Of course, when I say one charger, what I really mean was I had the one brick and then I had a couple USB micro cables and I had a, you know, a USB mini cable. And then, of course, I had my laptop power cable. And, uh, and so I just I literally have a little rollout pouch. And I've taken it to a couple of conferences and a couple loaned it out to a couple of people. But there's a rollout pouch with every possible cable you could possibly need. And uh, when USB-C first came out, the first USB-C device that I bought was my Lenovo X270. And I'll never remember, or I'll, I'll never forget the very first time that I sat inside of Chris's RV and grabbed his MacBook USB-C charger and plugged it into my ThinkPad. And lo and behold, his Apple accessory was powering my Lenovo laptop. That was a key moment. And I went, oh, that's how that can work. Soon after that, I purchased a Pixel, which also charged with USB-C. 
I then upgraded my work phone to a uh, Samsung Galaxy S8 that had USB-C. My wife got an S8 and a laptop that charges with USB-C. And I actually went through and ended up replacing all of my kids' tablets just to get them the new Galaxy Tab A that supported USB-C. First thing about USB-C that you should know is that it is a physically more durable connector. They have done a lot of research and engineering into this connector that it is actually very difficult to crush and it's very difficult to snap off. So the, the torque on the connector is very, very strong. It's better than the lightning connector, better than micro USB, all of those things. So it's a well-engineered connector. The second thing is they've put a lot of thought into the technology behind the physical plug. So once you have the plug plugged into your device, you can choose which direction power flows. So I have a USB-C cable, you can't see it, but I have it right here, and it's plugged in between my phone and my laptop. And I get to choose which way power flows. I can tell it to power my laptop from my phone, or I can tell it to power my phone off my laptop. Now, truth be told, each device has to be capable of powering the other before that option becomes available. I'm not telling you that my phone is actually capable of powering my laptop. What I will tell you is I can use the same charger for both. Now, historically, whether I want to admit it or not, the most reliable, the most functional, and the most universal USB-C charger that money can buy was the Apple one. If you purchase the Apple charger, it would charge your Apple devices, Samsung devices, HP devices, Lenovo devices, your phones. I have literally never had a device, except for the HP Spectre, that the Apple... 90-watt uh, power brick would not charge. Now, are they cheap? No, they're not. They're about $85 for the power brick alone and about another $35 for the cable. But you know what? I'm not an Apple guy, but this is a, if, if this is an open standards device, if I've ever seen one. The cable is a well-made USB-C cable. It's very, very long, so I can plug the brick in halfway across the room and still power my laptop. I had a friend who had a Pixel, and he had worn out the cable that Google sent, which... A, many regard to be a very high quality cable. We took the my Apple one and plugged it in and it worked just fine. I can almost, not quite, but I can almost hang my laptop. The weight will almost be supported by the grippiness of this cable. And it has not gone down. But this new, the, the, the downside to the Apple device is that the power brick is huge. And they have a smaller version but it's still not as small as this 27-watt USB-C uh, PD charger. Now, the downside, the, the thing that you have to look at when you're looking at PD, PD is power delivery. So every USB-C charger basically is going to charge your cell phone. You must have that power delivery or PD option for it to charge something like a laptop. And uh, you look for a couple of different things. So the first thing to look for in a USB-C charger is what voltage does it support? Does it just support the 5-something, 5.6 volts or 5.4 volts or whatever that your cell phone is at? Or does it support the uh, typically 19 volts that your laptop requires to run on? And so you want to look at both of those things. And then as far as the wattage goes, what that tells you is how fast your computer is going to charge. So... I have a 90 watt adapter and that will usually charge my laptop from a 10 or 11% all the way up to 100% in about an hour and 10 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, somewhere in there. I would expect that a 27 watt uh, adapter would probably take multiple hours because it's not a, it's not a um, linear scale. It's a, it's a logarithmic scale. LT guy in the chat room says, can I get a ThinkPad with USB C that still has removable batteries, maintenance, Hatches, docking connector, 2.5 inch drive bays. Lenovo is driving off the train or the train off the rails. Well, the X270 has most of those things. It does have a USB C power uh, charging port. It does contain a removable battery. Now, there's two batteries in the, the X270. The first is the power center that's in the front, the second one is a removable battery at the rear. Uh, maintenance hatches. Not sure exactly what maintenance hatches are. Are, but if you're talking about does the bottom of the laptop go come off? No, not with latches, but you can remove six screws and then it does. Docking connector, yes, both through the USB-C port and a dedicated docking connector at the bottom. And 2.5-inch hard drive base, also affirmative in the X270. But you're right, 
he points out that that is not available in the X280. I don't recommend purchasing the X280. I will not be purchasing the X280, and here's why. If I was going to buy another uh, laptop and I was interested in something like the X280, I would just buy the X1 because the X1 is the same physical size as the X280, except it has more screen real estate. So they've shrunken the bezel down and managed somehow to fit a 14-inch amount of screen real estate inside of the same chassis size that the 13-inch laptop, 13.3-inch laptop was. Um, and yeah, the, so the chat room clarifies that they're talking about the place where you can remove the small panels and RAM and hard drives and stuff like that. Again, not hatches per se, but come on, guys. I mean, you remove six screws, you pull it off. It's not that bad. But USB, th this Anchor 27-watt USB-C power delivery charger is a device that I could, if it works well, and if it charges every device I throw it against, I could easily see myself getting to a point where I say, okay, from now on, this is the standard. NOAA's standard go-to is a USB-C to USB-C cable and this Anchor 27-watt USB-C PD charger, simply because of its size, because it will go literally anywhere. And uh, as the article says, they're going to make a couple different versions. So the PD-1 will just be the 27-watt charger. The PD-2 will be a, um, a two-port USB-C charger, so you'll be able to power two devices at one time with 60 watts. And then they will have a PD, uh, no, that's a PD-1, sorry, the PD-2 will be a 100-watt version and four traditional USB, uh, USB, USB ports, so two USB-C and then four Type-A ports that you'll be able to charge. Um, and it's, it, I would order it today if, if it were available for sale. But... Uh, the ability, the, uh, the, I cannot overstate the ability to charge all of your devices with a single charger is, is just incredible. I have one charger I take with my, all of my family's devices. It also means that I've got a charger in the car. It's a 45 watt PD capable car charger. So I can charge my laptop from the same thing, from the same exact cable and the same exact charger that charges my cell phone every time I get in and out of the car. And the ability to share between manufacturers means that we are quickly reaching a point where everything and everybody can share power except for iPhone users because they're still stuck on the stupid lightning connector. And frankly, and I've asked iPhone users up and down, none of them can give me a particularly good answer as to why Apple hangs on to that the stupid lightning connector. I mean, I suppose for legacy purposes because it's not any more durable. In fact, uh, the USB-C connector is a more durable connector. The USB-C connector is a more reliable connector because the, the, the physical pins are not exposed. There's a, there's a hood around the pins, and so they can't rust or be exposed to water or anything like that. And it's not really that much thicker. So I'm not sure where Apple was going with that. Time will eventually tell. Again, you too can join the program, 1-855-450-NO. It's 855-450, the email. Live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard. Become a part of the program. So... If you're not in the Telegram group, you should be. Telegram.asknoahshow.com. That's where the show continues 24-7-365. We have an ongoing party in there. Lots of people have joined to provide support for one another, and uh, a bunch of other little small groups have spun off of the main Telegram group. We now have an Ask Noah Photography group. We have an Ask Noah Business. Or, well, it's not really Ask Noah Business, but there is a, a, a small business group filled with a bunch of community members from the Ask Noah uh, chat room. And uh, it's turned into a little mini community. Well, uh, I had a gentleman that uh, reached out to me over Telegram and said, uh, hey, I just I just wanted you to know that I had uh, I have a story for you about installing Linux. And I said, OK, well, you install Linux. Lots of people install Linux. What makes you special? And he says, well, I went to my public library and I ended up getting the police involved because they were called on me when I installed, uh, when I was, I didn't even, I wasn't, didn't actually install it on their computer. I just installed it on my portable hard drive and the, the, the library was concerned about that. So joining me on the program is Rillian. Hey, Rillian, welcome to the Ask Noah show. Oh, hello. Tell me how the police got involved with you installing Linux, and, and that warranted a call to the police, and, and they became involved with that situation. How did that happen? Tell me the story. Before I got a computer, I used to use um, the library's computers quite a lot. And um, at first, what I did was uh, there's this program called uh, Portable Apps, 
which you basically install this thing onto a USB drive and it allows you to, um, it's like a package manager that downloads Windows apps onto a USB drive. I was using that um, to install programs onto a USB drive. Uh, then I later thought, hey, why don't I use um, my own operating system off a USB hard drive or something um, on these computers? So that's what I did. I installed uh, Linux onto a USB hard drive. And um, and yeah, so I started using Linux off this hard drive. It went um, good and um, some of the library stuff even seemed like, I don't know if impressed is the right word, but they um, didn't seem to have any problems with it. And one of the guys um, said that oh, their management was having a bit of a problem and they didn't exactly want me to... Um, be running this and so I thought oh okay it's um, just a little problem and so I stopped running this at their library but I continued at uh, another library for a while what did the police say when they when they came in did they understand what you were doing I even mean, they show up and obviously they noticed that that one computer looks different than all of the other ones but did they really have the technical understanding of what you were doing or were they pretty confused well what actually happened was um, I was in the library, and at the time I was um, playing around with Docker containers, um, and so I was using quite a bit of the terminal and stuff, and it caused some people to think that it looks a bit shady. Um, later that day, I actually got a call from the police. Um, what was really weird was their account of it said that I had been seen using a Raspberry Pi along with their computers, and they thought maybe I'd be I'd been stealing people's data. Um, of state data of the people who also use those computers. So it started almost as a, as a as a data theft collection kind of a thing. They were worried about you stealing somebody's identity or something like that. That's kind of why them. So it wasn't necessarily they worried about the Linux. It's they were worried about the identity theft uh, standpoint. So that they come and they they call you up and they say, "Hey, we heard that you were here and you you were doing some weird things that we didn't really understand. And so uh, if you're going to use a library of computers, you're gonna you're gonna have to settle down and use Windblows." Uh, yeah, they actually, um, because the library kind of pressed for it, they actually um, and they actually um, took away my Raspberry Pi, which I hadn't used anywhere in conjunction with the library's computers. Uh, they also took away an encrypted USB drive, which caused a bit of hassle. Did you, uh, this encrypted drive, was it encrypted with Lux? Uh, yeah, using a crypt setup. Okay, so there was little to no chance they're ever going to get any of the data off of that drive. So that, I would imagine, added another layer of complexity and confusion to them because now they can't get to this drive and they already suspect you're doing something kind of hinky and now they've got this drive and it's encrypted, they can't get to it. So did they question you at all about that? Um, well, um, I actually gave them the, um, the key for it because um, all I had on there was basically... a. Uh, backups of programs and stuff so i had nothing to hide in it would um i just basically wanted my stuff back and it would go much faster i mean i i can tell that you that you have a, a little bit different of an accent and i know because of the time difference that you're obviously not from the united states but uh, for everybody else that's listening can you tell us where did this happen i live in the uk um in cornwall yeah i was, I was using a, a one of cornwall libraries Thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to to not only write in the show, but but actually set aside some time so that we could kind of pick your brain about this. It's a, it's a fun, unique story. I can say that there are a lot of people that have tried to put Linux in a lot of different places. You are the first person I've ever spoken with that, <laughs> that has gotten the police involved. Um, so obviously, if you need any help with uh, with the future endeavors with a computer, if anybody else out there does, please uh, don't take over library computers. Just reach out to us live at asknoshow.com. We'll be happy to help out. Thanks so much for joining the Ask Noah Show. We really appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. I wasn't really sure what to say about that, and chat room calls it sounds like nanny state behavior. When you're worried about what op... I mean, this goes back to, this goes back to our discussion earlier in the hour. People see things they don't understand and that they don't expect to see on a computer screen. It makes them nervous. So huge thanks to uh, Rillian for coming on the program and chatting with us and explaining that story. Like I said, I thought it's kind of a fun thing that we don't, we all have installed Linux on some, at some time or some place. Not many of us have had any interaction with the police. So I thought that was kind of a, uh, a fun story worth sharing. Um, 
I want to tell you what's coming up the the next week or so. So we are in the midst of uh, some big changes at the Ask Noah show and ones that um, I am embracing and trying to make the most of. On what we're trying to do is make sure that we are keeping our edge, making sure that we don't develop crutches, make sure that we don't become complacent. We want to make sure that we're serving you, the community. And we only know that if you let us know how we're doing. So we want you to go to asknoahshow.com slash better and let us know what you think about the programs that we're doing. If you like, we're going to be trying some different formats. We're going to be doing a lot of interviews and we're going to try to get a lot of information to you. One of the things that I'm going to try to do in uh, not, not, not this coming week, but the week after, is uh, we're going to try to do a show five days in a row. So to give you an idea what that looks like, we're going to have a show tomorrow, October 30th. No, I'm sorry. We're going to have a show tomorrow is going to be October 27th. We'll have another episode for you October 30th. That's a Tuesday. Then we'll have a show November 2nd, November 3rd, November 4th, November 5th, and November 6th, uh, culminating to a 100th edition episode on November 7th. Now, the November 7th episode, if you don't listen to any of the rest of those, make sure, absolutely sure that you catch the November 7th edition of the Ask Noah show because we are going to be having a huge party in Minneapolis, St. Paul. We're going to be joined with uh, Brandon Johnson from Red Hat, and as well as there's going to be some big announcements coming up leading up to that. So you'll definitely want to catch as many of those episodes as you can, but for sure, all of the really important stuff will happen on our regularly scheduled day. So that would be October 30th. Uh, that's a Tuesday. And then the Monday after that, which would be November 6th. Make absolutely sure that you check out those two episodes because there's going to be some really important information coming, some really big announcements. Now, we are not just doing five episodes to pump out five episodes of content. That's not what we're doing at all. All of these episodes, we are going to put what I think is really incredible content and stuff that we just don't have the time to facilitate during the day because we come on the air at 6 p.m. Ultra Speed Technologies literally closes its doors at 6 p.m. So we just don't have a lot of time in between the time that I wrap up my day job and the time that I sit down here on the microphone. Literally about 10 minutes. And, so, and I cut that short. I cut that out of Ultra Speed's time. And so what we wanted to do is do a couple of episodes at 9 p.m. and on the weekends where I'm not doing anything else and so I can really, really dig in and dedicate some time to producing some good episodes. Now, if this is well-received, if you guys, if there, are, if there are high download numbers and there are large streaming numbers, we're going to look at that information, correlate that data and say, this is something people really like, this is something that people really want, and so we're going to continue to do it. So let me show you, or let me tell you what we have coming up thus far. Tomorrow, October 27th, Fred Gleason is going to show it, join us. Now, Fred Gleason is a broadcast engineer. This guy has spent his life studying broadcast systems. And guess what? He's a huge Linux nerd. So when Fred Gleason was working for Cumulus Media, yeah, you might have heard of them. He looked at what they were using for software and said, this is crap and it won't do all of the things you want. And it's going to cost a lot more money um, than if we just write some software from scratch. But here's the thing. I'm only going to write some software from scratch if we can write it on Linux and open source. And Fred Gleason did just that. So he created what he calls a broadcast appliance. This is an audio box first. So it's audio. It doesn't do video. It just does audio. But this is an audio appliance that you literally order from his company and you plug in and you you turn it on, boot it up, and it runs a uh, it runs just stock CentOS and uh, with XFCE, but has his software integrated right into it and will allow you to be do ultimate, ultimately reliable uh, broadcasting incorporated with Linux over IP. And uh, we have been using his software here in the studio since the day that we uh, went on the air, essentially. And that's what kicks off the intro music and outro music and it, it what handles our button bar and handles the interviews and turns the channels on the mixer on and off and allows us to do remote broadcast. All of that stuff happens with the software called Rivendell. And the, the, the developer of it, Fred Gleason, will be with us tomorrow night to talk to us about what the software is capable of. Then, coming up next week, Jason Donafield from WireGuard is going to give us a detailed deep dive into uh, WireGuard and what this extremely simple yet fast and modern VPN uh, technology that utilizes state-of-the-art cryptography. 
And um, we talked about it briefly on the show, but I cannot tell you about these things to the same level and to the same uh, authenticity that the people who actually write and actually do these things can. So we're going to have him on. Uh, also coming up next week, Richard Hip from SQL Lite. We we're originally going to have Richard on this week, but this is not going to, that was uh, scheduling didn't quite work out. So he's going to come join us next week and he's going to talk about the COC controversy. Now you may remember we had a conversation about the code of conduct for the Linus kernel and we'd had Paul M. Jones on to talk about the dangers of some codes of conduct. Well, Richard Hip has a completely different version of a code of conduct. He has a version of the code of conduct that essentially does the exact opposite. It goes the exact opposite way. Instead of leaning far one way, it leans far the other way. And uh, irritated a lot of people, caused a big stir. But we're going to get the information right from the horse's mouth, as it were. So we're going to invite Richard onto the program, and we're going to talk to him. Then... I'm just, I'm so happy that all these people want to come on the Ask Noah show. And I, I've not reached out to, I, I think I reached out to Richard, but the rest of these people, they've all reached out to us and said, Hey, we want to come on the program. And so we're, Oh, and I reached out to Fred cause I'm a huge Fred Gleason fan. But, um, most of these people have reached out to us and said, we're interested in coming on the program. And that means so much to me as a content producer that, that people see the value in the program and are interested in, uh, in sharing their message on our platform. Patrick McBride, Senior Director of Patents from Red Hat, is going to come on the program and he's going to talk to us about Microsoft joining the Open Invention Network and what that means to the rest of the Linux community. Because let me tell you, there are some people that are pretty upset about this. And um, again, it's one of those things where we're just going to go straight to the uh, straight to the horse of mouth. We're just going to ask the questions and we'll let him tell us from a multi-billion dollar company what Red Hat's approach to this is, why Red Hat supports this, or I guess if they support it, but I assume that they do because he wants to come on the program and talk about it, and how that's actually going to benefit us. So that's going to be a fair, a really cool episode. And and this, again, this is one of those ones where I'm just super excited because it means so much to me that these people are willing to come on the program and talk to us. Eric Dubois, he is the head honcho at Arch Arco Linux. And if you have not heard of Arco Linux, I'm telling you, you have to check this distribution out. Arco Linux is Arch Linux, but it's the kind of Arch Linux that you use when you want to learn a lot about Linux. When you don't just want to use it as a desktop operating system, you actually want to learn about Linux and about technology. He gives you a sane set of defaults in Arch, but lets you break it essentially and kind of explore and and teaches you about the computer and the the entire purpose of the distribution is to experiment with technology and enjoy technology and own technology and learn technology all of those kinds of things everything that we at the ask noah show really appreciate and a huge thanks to my friends over at destination linux for setting that one up um, they were able to get us in contact and said hey we think this guy would be really interested uh, and an interesting interview and all of those sorts of things. And so I'm obviously very appreciative uh, to the Destination Linux group. Speaking of my friends at Destination Linux, we recorded um, our second episode today. Uh, so I joined them as a guest host today. I joined them as a guest host last week. So if the, if the, if the last fan in you misses the Linux video world and you're looking to get back into that scene my friends over at linux academy michael tonnell owner of tux digital and ryan uh, also das geek in the chat room um and zeb they all do a fantastic job at giving you the latest up-to-date news they do uh, essentially a replacement of the app picks as well as they do a gaming news section man if i haven't learned a lot of stuff about gaming on Linux from these guys because they are true testaments to the Linux broadcasting professional. And so we're super, super happy that um, they're super, I'm super, super happy to be a part of their program and that uh, they let me come hang out with them and just, just hang out and chat about Linux. By the way, if you're a Patreon subscriber of theirs, you can actually join the show as we record it live. And then we do like a little hangout session afterwards where you just get to sit down and, uh, and shoot the crap with the host. Something I actually really miss doing a traditional radio show. Hey guys, did you know this episode is available as a downloadable podcast? If you want to download the episode or you want to check out the show notes, head over to podcast.asknoahshow.com. We're going to include all of the articles that we talk about so you can read them in their full goodness. We'd always invite you to follow us on Twitter at Ask Noah Show. That's the best place to get information right up to the day, uh, right up to the minute. We let you know when we're going to be live. We'll see you tomorrow night, Saturday at 9 p.m. Central. 